<laughs> Max Schwert from Marlboro, Massachusetts. You are a technician at HomeServe USA, and more importantly, and the reason that you are here with me today, you are the winner of the 2022 Service Titan HVAC National Championship. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, thank you for having me, Jackie. I am so stoked to talk to you. I unfortunately did not get to go down to Tampa with the rest of my team to watch the uh, competition. So I'm so happy to have the time with you now. Before we even get into this, I just want to let folks know a little bit about what the heck the Service Titan HVAC National uh, Championship is. So this happened back in Tampa in November, I think, right? At the Tampa Convention Center. We partnered yep. with Train to create challenges for, for techs all over the country, such as yourselves. And you guys competed to figure out who was the best tech there was in the competition. We had service site industry experts judging as well as Train judging the event as well. And you won. So tell me about you entering the competition. What inspired you to do it? Um, so... I kind of entered the competition on a whim. Uh, so like I sign up for all the things on the internet, you know, HVAC related. And uh, one morning I just came across an email about the, the championship, you know, and since it was the first one ever, so I knew absolutely nothing about it. But the first round was, you know, like a five minute Nate question quiz. Uh, so I just did it in the morning, didn't think anything of it. And a guy I work with, I emailed that link to him uh just so he could do it too and then we could kind of like battle back and forth and see who does it better and uh i think i forget how many i got right out of the gate but he like doubled the amount that i got right so i was like oh my god <laughs> and so then i just went back we kind of like battled back and forth for like a, a couple weeks and then as soon as i did better than him i was like cool that's it i'm happy i'm done and i didn't even think anything of it um and I think that was in like July or something. And then I got an email in September that said, oh, you qualified for round two. And I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> and what was round two? So round two was um, they were going to send you a kit to your house that you had to put together and braze and, you know, do it with all the PPE and the proper procedure, putting it together and make a video and time yourself. Um, so I kind of waited a while to do it. And then uh, I think... Uh, we had like a birthday party we had to go to for my kids or whatever. And it was like the last weekend before I had to send it in. And I'm like, tell my wife, oh, I was going to have the kids film me do it. And then uh, my wife came and uh, so she filmed me and did it. Didn't think anything of it, submitted it, whatever. You know, it was just something cool to do. And then uh, fast forward another month in October, all of a sudden I got an email that said, oh, congratulations, you're going to Tampa. <laughs> and I was totally shocked um so i was totally surprised by that and then um and then i remember getting an email in like the middle of october and it was like oh hey by the way you're gonna be on television uh can you answer these questions or whatever <laughs> and so i was like yep nope not doing it i told my wife i'm not doing it i'm like that's it i'm all set <laughs> and uh when you got kids anytime you can get away She's like, oh, hell no, you're going to, you're doing it. We're going to Florida. We're going to go away for a couple days. <laughs> sure, sure. So, next thing I know, we're flying to Florida right after Halloween, you know? Oh, my So, it was pretty wild. Yeah, because we had an early flight that morning. Um, so, we had Halloween. We do Halloween at my house. We got a good neighborhood walk around. So, we were up late with that. And then we had to wake up at like 3 in the morning to go catch a plane that got delayed because there was ice or whatever. And then we missed the connected flight. It was like 14 hours to get from Boston to Florida. It was a nightmare. Oh my goodness. That does sound like yeah. a nightmare. But <laughs> another nightmare that it sounds like you alluded to is the fact that you did not want to be on television. You had no idea yeah. that, that was part of the deal. Tell me about that. Yeah. Now I have you on camera right now talking to me on for a podcast, yes. but continue. <laughs> so it was, um, I don't know. I've never been on television. I didn't think I had a face for TV or any of that. Um, plus it was the unknown. Like, you know, I had nothing to compare it to. I didn't know, you know, uh, any previous years, what they did or anything like that. So I was just totally out of my comfort zone. You know, I spent my life in a basement or in an attic with no cameras on me whatsoever. <laughs> so that whole experience was pretty new and wild. 
Yeah. Well, tell me about like the actual competition because there was two live rounds, right? Yes. Yeah. So the first round, um, it, well, in the morning we got to watch the apprentices go first. Uh, so that was kind of cool. It kind of took the edge off. Like you could see what's going on. Um, you didn't really go in totally blind. So that was kind of cool to watch apprentices do their thing. And then next thing, you know, we go to this like briefing room and, uh, and you watch this like, you know, two minute video on what you're going to do. So nobody knows what you're actually doing till like, I think it was like 15 minutes before we went out there and did it. Um, so it, was, it was pretty cool. Um, and then, so we had, basically we had a vent, a uh, furnace, and we had to do the condensate for the furnace. You know, we had the specs, how we had to vent it, you know, um, and how they wanted everything done. So, you know, it's just doing, it was like stuff I do all the time, you know? Sure. Yeah. So that kind of made it easy in a way where it's like, okay, it's just go to work, you know, do, do your job. Um, so, yeah, so that was pretty wild going out. And then, you know, we all lined up in a row. Then they called us out. Next thing you know, you're out there. And, uh, but when it goes to work, I kind of just, you know, tunnel vision and do my job, you know. I'm sure that tunnel vision helped because, like you said, it's like I do, it's like what I do every day at work. But now I'm in front of a live audience. It wasn't just in front of cameras. You also had a live audience watching you do it. So, what was yeah. that like? Yeah. But I mean, I, like I'm used to people watching me work because you go into people's houses all the time and, you know, true, true. everybody wants to, uh, you know, come watch what you do. And uh, that never bothers me. I'm like, pull up a chair, you know, we'll figure it out together, whatever you want to do. Uh, so having somebody watching me really doesn't bother me while I'm working at all. So that, that Actually, kind of made it easy. Actually, if they really wanted to like turn up the heat on the competition, they should have you actually doing work on someone's house. Someone who's very particular and a yeah. very a very an high micromanager <laughs> an engineer yes yeah, have you all compete critical. at an engineer's house that would really uh, spice it up for next year note for next time but anyway you had a few rounds you eventually got into the final round and i know you had some issues with a filter dryer so tell me about how you dealt with that <laughs> yes so the it was kind of cool because you know the way they had all the stations set up you couldn't see what anybody else was doing you know in the first round so you couldn't i couldn't really you know, look at what anybody else was doing. So it was just, you go to town, do your own thing. And in the final round, you really, you know, it was spaced out where you really couldn't see what anybody else was doing. Um, so when I was going along, you know, we had a zoom lock and uh, the refrigerant lines going up to the condenser and everything. So I was just kind of listening to hear if I could hear them still zoom locking or if they were on to that, to the wiring. And um, so I went and put the filter dryer in you know, and at that time, uh, in Florida, I was sweating because I live in Massachusetts. I like the cold. <laughs> so, and then you got to wear the hard hat and the PVE and all, all that stuff. So every time I'd, I'd look down, I'd sweat and my, the glasses would just, it was like, I'm looking underwater, looking through the glasses, looking at my tape measure and everything. Uh, so when I put the filter dry and I didn't even think about it, put it in. And then I come back and I'm like, oh shit, I think I put it in backwards. You know, so I had two options. I could flip the stick, sticker around, but then I'm on camera, so you can't. So, um, so luckily, you know, I had enough couplings and everything. I could cut it out, splice it around. And at that point, I thought totally, like, that was it. I just shot myself in the foot, you know. Uh, so after that, I was kind of, like, mad at myself for a little bit. And then, um, and then I was just like, you know what, whatever, just fly and do the best I can and go from there. Well, you weren't, that wasn't the end. You ended up winning the competition, which is freaking amazing. So tell me, how did it feel to win that competition and how did it change your opinion of yourself? So I was very shocked uh, that I won because I didn't like going down there. I didn't expect anything. It was just like fun. You know, it was cool to meet other guys uh, in the trade from all over the country, you know, doing what I do every day. Uh, so it was in all the guys down there that I met, everybody was wicked cool. Everybody's really nice. Um, so winning it was, it was a very humbling experience cause you know, you do this every day, right? You know, you go put a system in a basement or an attic or whatever. And the second you go upstairs or climb out, you shut the light off and nobody ever sees it again until something goes wrong, you know? So to be on like a stage like that and to win, it just kind of, like, 
like recertified what you're doing out there. Like, okay, you know, you're, you're doing good. It's worth it. It's not, you know, not worth anything. <laughs> um, so it was really good. It just boosted your confidence in what you do every day. Of course. Yeah. I, I totally get that. You know, when you work at a trade for so long and we're going to get into your history in a second, you know, sometimes yeah, it becomes your day to day. It becomes, you know, the regular minutia of everyday life. You know, I work a job to support my family. So it's kind of cool when you're declared the best of the best of what you do for something that you just on a whim were like, Hey, let me, uh, submit to this competition. So that's so, super cool. I'm so happy that you got that experience. That sounds incredible. Yes. Oh, me too. And I, I'm so thankful for all the service Titan and all the sponsors that they even, you know, wanted to put that on for the trades, you know, just all the uh, bringing awareness to the trades, you know? Yeah, well, actually, we partnered with Elite Trades, and they've been doing this for electrical contractors for so long. And so we wanted to bring the HVAC competition forward, and I believe we're doing it again next year. And we've had a couple of our customers say, hey, what about plumbing, which you are a plumber too, and we'll get to that in a second. Uh, so I think this is just a great way to celebrate the trades, because truly, 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 if we did not have HVAC, plumbing, and electrical like what would life be like, right? So yeah. I want to I want to move forward and get to know you a little bit. So we're switching around my normal podcast format. You and I have something in common. Both of our dads are carpenters. So I would love to know a little bit about how your dad's career influenced your decision to eventually become an HVAC technician. So I guess I've been around the trades my whole life, you know, with my father. And it was um, the... Weirdest thing is when, once I entered the trade, I like growing up, I thought everybody, like whenever something broke at your house, you just fixed it. Like whatever it was, you fixed it. You didn't call anybody to come over to do anything. And that's the way I grew up. It was like, okay, that's something broke. You fix it, whatever it is, you know, the roof, the plumbing, the electrical, whatever. So once I entered the trades and realized that, no, like there's a lot of people that don't even know how to the right way to turn a screwdriver. It was just mind blowing to me. Um, so with my father, you know, he told me, uh, you know, you want to get a job with a license, like an electrician or a plumber, you know, in Massachusetts, it's to become a plumber in Massachusetts. It's now it's a five year apprenticeship. Oh, wow. And then, uh, and I'm not sure what the electrician apprenticeship is, but to, you know, to be a carpenter, you just got to go take a test and boom, you're a carpenter. Um, so he, he kind of steered me to electrical or plumbing, you know, because once once you get that license, a lot of people won't go that far through school and everything. So it makes you kind of more valuable. And once you get it, you know, you're set for life. Um, so at the time I I was living in Florida, came back, start life over again. And um, I was working at a supermarket and every day I would go out to my car, open up the phone book <laughs> and call a plumber out of the phone book. And at that time it was like as many lawyers in the phone book, there was plumbers. So I think it took me all week, uh, calling them cause I would call and they'd be like, Oh, what's your experience? And I'd, I'd say, I, I have none. And they say, get some experience and call us back. And like, how do you, how do you get experience with if You can't hire me, you know? Um, so I remember I went all the way to Friday and I ended up on like W's. And I called this one company and they're like, oh, we're having a job fair tomorrow. Come on down. And um, so I went down and then uh, this guy, Keith, hired me. Well, he made me go to three interviews <laughs> before he hired me. So I owe a lot to Keith. <laughs> uh, I just need to say Keith's full name because the Keith who this was is Keith Mercurio, who's been a guest yeah. on this podcast and a speaker at Service Titans User Conference Pantheon. He was a next gen trainer, a next gen, oh my goodness, next star trainer for years. And he's a really big name in the trade. So when you told me that Keith Mercurio get, got your, you your first plumbing job, I was like, what? Uh, so how serendipitous, how crazy. Um, and I love that that was available to you, but also what a hustle you went from A to W in the phone book before you got a plumber who was willing to take you on without experience. Yeah, that was a nightmare. <laughs> oh my goodness. And you know, what's like crazy to me. So we're going to get into some other stuff in a second, because one of the reasons I wanted you on is in at the show, in the show, I talk with owners and operators all the time about how I can't find techs, I can't find good techs. How do you retain and hire the best techs? And you are arguably one of the best techs. So I want to talk to you about that, right? So 
What are some things that owners and operators should consider as they look to hire the best techs in their area? So that company, what, what they wanted when they hired me was they wanted, pe- you know, they wanted people that knew nothing. So they could kind of mold, you know, so you had no bad habits coming in and they could kind of mold you into what they wanted you to be, you know? So starting out from nothing, that was a great place to come into and learn the trade. Um, I guess once you're established in the trade for people to hire somebody, you know, communication skills is huge. Being able to talk to a customer, um, being dependable, um, when it comes to HVAC, being Nate certified is really good. You know, then you, you know, you have a background on what you're doing, um, being customer focused, you know, paying attention to the customer's needs, what they want, um, have, I guess having a personality goes a long way when you're dealing with customers. Uh, there's a lot of people that I run to the trades that are, uh, I don't know how to say it, like duds going into houses, you know, and, sure. um, and with the homeowners, I don't know, they want, I feel like, you know, you break down a lot of barriers when you, you're friendly with them and then they end up trusting you, you know, um, but yeah, I don't know, really. I, don't do, I don't do much hiring, so. <laughs> well, actually, I, I realize it's a shitty way for me to ask that question. So I want to, I want to try it a different way when it comes to people in your experience, cause you've worked at a couple of companies now, right? Yeah. Who, who make, what kind of qualities do you see the best techs tend to have? So the, the best techs are positive people. <laughs> cause I run into a lot of people in the trades are negative, negative all the time. And it, it's, it's, uh, it's really easy to be negative, I guess. Uh, so the best techs I run into are positive people that always want to learn, uh, want to do the training, um, and are willing to work, you know, hard workers. Um, they don't, you know, don't give up on a job. You know, they, they want to figure it out and stay there. Um, that's really, you know, the yeah, core of, sure. of, of a good tech. So when you were training at Keith's company, when they were molding you into that perfect tech, did you go from, how did that work for you? Were you like in classes at the company for a couple of weeks and you went to apprentice? What did that look like? Do you remember? So that place, so I got really lucky there. So there, there was actually a good group of guys working there at the time that, um, were, if you were willing to learn and, and were into the trade and like, and just not like a job, like you were really into the trade then th- these group of guys, they were willing to teach you, you know, like what you put in, they were willing to teach you. And, and so every day, you know, you line up the shop and they pick you for an apprentice and you ride along on the day. So if you didn't, if nobody wanted to work with you, <laughs> you were, you got the, you know, low end of the job and with the guy that, you know, didn't want to go with. So if you were showing like enthusiasm and you really wanted to work, I got lucky like with a good group of guys that wanted to teach and spend the extra time with you. Um, so I got really lucky there and that made me have that same mentality to want to teach other people. If you want to learn, you know, piggyback on me and we'll, we'll go to town and do everything together, you know? Um, so I, so I got really, really lucky there. Also like a really good experience there. The owner of that company, he would, um, go out on a limb and send you away for training. So like one, one year he sent me to the ultimate technician Academy in Arkansas. And it was, you know, to invest the money in you to be a better technician, you know? So that was a really cool experience for me, um, where they wanted to invest in, into the employee to grow in the trade, you know? So that, that was really cool. And that I was able to learn a lot real quick by the group of guys I was with in the training that he was sending me to. That's dope. And how long ago was this, by the way? Uh, probably like 2010, 2012 and in, in that period. Got it. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so by the way, when did, so this was all for plumbing at the beginning. When did you add HVAC to your skill set? Yeah. So we were plumbing and then, you know, the summertime we would, 
do like an outdoor shower, simple stuff. And then one day, uh, I just remember going to the shop and uh, they were like, hey, you know, you, you, and you, and you are going to the blast to get your EPA and we're going to start doing AC. <laughs> so I think I spent three nights at a supply house, got my EPA. And the next day I had a uh, no AC call and had no idea, just praying it was a dirty filter. <laughs> so it's because the company you were working at decided to add HVAC and they identified you as, okay, he's one of our best techs who's going to learn this and we'll send him to train basically. Yeah. Yep. Overnight. That's it. Boom. We're doing AC. But that's great um, for it, you because yeah. that makes you, oh, yeah. I'm sorry, that makes you more competitive and that makes you able to transfer your skills to more and more companies, right? Oh, absolutely. Like here in Massachusetts, it's uh, it's pretty common that, you know, if you can book, if you can get a plumbing license and do air conditioning, it's like you're, you're almost guaranteed a job wherever you want to go. And, uh, you know, HVAC is becoming so big um, now that it's almost like you, you got to, you know, as far as the heating world, you, you got to. You got to know yeah. it. Yeah, exactly. All right. So I want to get a little bit more into the nitty gritty of actually working with owners and operators. Because again, I talk to so many of them on this podcast. It's so rare that I get to speak to someone else who's on the other side of it, right? So tell me if you would be so kind about your best experience with the boss and your worst experience with the boss. So I think my best experience would be um, like that. the first company I worked at with Keith was was him just believing in you to spend the money to send you away and to do all this training so you can grow. Um, to me, that's huge. Like, you know, it shows that he, he, you know, expects, expects you to learn and wants you to grow in the trade, um, and invest the time and money and the training into you. I mean, that, that would be probably the, the best experience with a boss that believes in you and wants to, you know, put you out there. Um, the worst experience I had was when I was, a uh, I was at a, a plumbing apprentice and I went to this one company, I think I was only there for a month. And, uh, so this company, the way the owner would do it, it was crazy. So say I went to go work with a guy and we were going to go like put in a toilet or whatever. And as an apprentice, I'm carrying in the, you know, the tank or the bowl and say I hit the wall and, and break the tank. That tank would come out of the other technician, the licensed plumber's paycheck. So he would, so if you, you broke apart or whatever, it would come out of the technician's paycheck. You deduct it out of the guy's pay. So the, the previous apprentice at this place broke a lot of stuff. So when I came in as the new apprentice, nobody really wanted like I could, I would just stand there. <laughs> you know, I remember sitting in the guy's truck and he told me, you know, we're going to walk in this house and you shut the fuck up. You don't say a word. You do anything to ruin the sale. You're going to walk back to the shop. <laughs> like that's it. So it was real awkward. And then there, you know, nobody would want you to come work with them because they don't want you to, to ruin their sale or, uh, you know, break something that may come out of their check. So then I was just sitting around the shop. And he would make me, uh, you know, weed the bark mulch. I remember one day he made me go to his house and put in his patio furniture for the fall and wanted me to rake his yard. And uh, I'm like, I'm not learning anything, you know. And my buddy called me and he's like, hey, you want to go do new construction? And I was like, yep. <laughs> so I tailed it out of there and did new construction for two years. Oh my God. What a horrible That would be the worst, worst experience. Yeah. That's like a trade internship from hell. At least you were getting paid yeah. for that, right? <laughs> yeah. Minimum, minimal wage. And actually yeah. speaking of, I should ask, so you've worked in new construction as well. Right now, do you primarily do residential service and replacement? So yeah, the company I work for now, they're uh, really primary all residential. Um, and probably 90% of the work we do is like uh, policy work. So you take a contract out on your equipment, your air conditioning, you know, heating or your water heater. And it, um, the contract covers pretty much 95% of all the components with it. it covers everything other than repair. You know, there's no fee for us to show up to your house. 
do whatever you got to do, order whatever part and fix it and move on. Um, so it's really nice. So I don't have to really worry about selling or sell to live. I just got to be a tech and figure it out and fix it. So I love what you just said about your, uh, about your current employer. So the way they have it set up and it's a union shop too, right? Yeah. Well, it's union, but it's not like I go to a hall and check in every day or anything. Okay. It's not like that. So they used to be the, um, so they, we used to be the service side to a utility company in Massachusetts. And then they bought out the, the utility company didn't want to do service anymore. And they bought out that service side. Um, okay, cool. So that's where the whole union thing came from. Got it. But what your company has that you really like is that all of these uh, customers buy into this policy. So they already covered everything and you don't have to worry about upselling them for something. You don't have to worry about selling. You said selling to live. So yes. uh, interestingly enough, a lot of the people that I have on the show, they endorse performance-based pay. They endorse... Um, Sell, having selling in text. And I would love to know your opinion on that. What's And your personal preference too, because right, everyone's got their own way how they like to do things. But for you, it sounds like you don't really enjoy selling, which is totally fine. Yeah. So I don't, um, so a company I did work for, they, we were paid by the hour and then they, they did switch to commission, you know, performance based, I guess that's a nicer way to say it. So it was like a commission um, based. So you got a percentage of whatever you sold. So what I experienced there with that company was, you know, the little old lady that can't walk downstairs to the basement, they would sell her ridiculous stuff that she doesn't need, or they'd sell her something and not do it, you know? Yeah. And um, so I ran into like a lot of unethical selling, which isn't everywhere, you know, but, um, but the selling, you know, they, t they, they always said, you know, treat them like your, your mother or your sister. And then they go out there and like, selling stuff you don't want to, you don't need, you know, so that, I, that was a huge turnoff for me. So I ended up doing install for that company, which was great because if somebody else would sell it, I'd go in and then just do what I had to do and, and go on from there. Um, but people that can sell, you can make a boatload of money doing that. You know, it's a huge incentive for the company. I mean, I get it. You know, you can raise numbers really big by that, that way of, of selling. Um, but I'm more, I feel like I'm more of like a mechanic. I, I just want to go, I want to fix it. You know, I don't want to deal with that drama of selling it. Um, I'd rather just go there and focus on, uh, you know, the technical side of it. I, by the way, I am totally with you. There was a short, short, short time in my career where I did sales and I was like, oh, this is not for me. This yeah. is not for me. Uh, so I appreciate that. And I think, you know, a note to note owners, right, is like, as you have performance pay, as you have these different structures, thinking about what your tech strengths are and what they can best work to. And it sounds like for you, you're like, I am happy just being the mechanic. As long as I don't have the pressure to sell, I'm going to do great work. So you yeah. said something that I really want to get into because I think this is going to be the spiciest part of the interview. So here <laughs> at Service Titan, we created guides to HVAC and plumbing salaries, which are linked in the show notes of this episode to anyone listening. Um, so we basically compiled all of the pay data, pay, pay, oh my God, I can't think of the word. Uh, all of the salary data across the United States uh, for the trades at different levels. And here are some things that we found, and I would love to get your reaction to them. We found that in your home state of Massachusetts, the average entry HVAC salary is $51,000 a year, which then goes up to $65,000 a year after two to four years of experience. And at the senior level, we see techs making between $70,000 and $92,000 a year. Do you think that that's enough to get young people interested in the trades? Um, probably not, <laughs> but what I've run into is, um, I mean, I get, so when I was an apprentice, I think I started out making $10 an hour and back then I, you can't really do it now. So they, they, you, you know, I was treated like an apprentice, like, <laughs> you know, they sent me to the splash house to get the blue bucket of steam. You know, you call this place for things that don't exist. Um, you know, they send you to Dunkin' Donuts with a piece of plywood this big to get drinks for everybody. And now it's like, uh, it's a whole different world. You can't really do that. Um, but I think, but you can really, 
increase your hourly rate depending on how hard you work quickly mm. in the trade, I feel like. And um, I feel like it didn't make take too long to really, you know, start making the seventy to eighty thousand dollars a year. And then after that, once you get licensed, you can make eighty, I feel like minimums around eighty and up. Um, you know, the come like I, I get paid by the hour now. In the overtime, it's it's almost like all the overtime you ever want to work is out there. Uh, yeah. But I'm trying to figure out how to make more money and work less. So aren't we all? Aren't we all? <laughs> but yeah, I think it's interesting you do the to performance based thing. <laughs> um, I think it's an interesting thing to talk about. So given those salary ranges that I that I gave you, and like you know, there's a hiring crisis in the trades. You said HVAC is blowing up right now. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Do you think that those, not even just entry level people, younger people, do you think that those salaries are enough to keep people in the trades? Not at 50, no. Yeah. I think, I think you, like once you're licensed, I think you got to be, you know, 80 to 100. Yeah, I think so too. You know, no way around that. Yeah, um, something to consider. I feel like the, the problem, as far as like a shortage in the trade is um, not a lot of people want to work hard nowadays or it's like the easy buck. Um, I mean, my kids want to be YouTubers and not in the trade. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, financially, you know, like showing the what what people make annually and uh you know as far as the trade once you learn it, it's it's very rewarding like i said like you don't have to have somebody come over to your house to fix something you can fix it uh you better believe when you got a plumbing or hvc truck parked in your driveway your neighbor's going to come over and knock um you know when my father told me to get into the trade you know plumbing he said you'll never go out with work I never knew you know i'll be working weekends holidays after work you know there's going to be all the work you want if you want to go and find it, you know? Um, so you can, you can make a lot of money in the trade. Yeah, no, it's definitely opportunity there. Some other stuff that we've heard on the show and what we found while we were researching these data pieces, right? Is that we found that owners say that sign on bonuses, rewards for new referral hires, uh, performance pay, which we talked about and a positive company culture is the best way to retain techs. Do you agree with that? Cash is king. So <laughs> absolutely. You know, uh, I think where I work now, the one of the biggest turn ons for me is, is that I don't have to sell, you know, that's not like, that's not a big thing for me. But where I work, I also get uh, like right now I have four weeks paid vacation, six, that's great. six days. Uh, I worked at companies before I never knew sick days. I didn't even know what a sick day was before I came here. Um, so the vacation time is really good in another year and a half, I'll get another week. So I'll get five weeks paid vacation plus six sick days. You got a company vehicle to come home with. That's huge. Cause if you can bring your truck home, that's the expense of a, you know, having another car wear and tear and all that. Um, so I think, you know, the money, absolutely. But also the time off is huge because I talk to people that have been in the trades for years and all they get is two weeks. That's it. You know, yeah. Um, having a time off to be with your family, I think is huge to me. I th I'm so happy that you brought that up because I think that's big as well. I mean, that's what I'm seeing in tech too, which is where I've made, I've mostly been. Mac, you've been so generous with your time. I've got two more questions for you that I really want you to answer. The first yep. is what do owners operators get wrong about managing techs? Um, I think the thing that drives me nuts, I guess, would be when, you know, uh, and a boss rewards a, a technician for bad behavior by like, you know, so say, a guy goes to a call and he's like, yeah, I don't know it. Send, you know, send somebody else there. And then somebody else has to go do it or clean up their mess. 
opposed to and then they can just go on about their day and continue to do and everything so then they get into that route oh you know i don't want to learn it i don't need to learn it send you know send somebody else over there uh instead of sending that guy with the other person so they can learn and grow uh so the thing that drives me nuts is is i guess when they reward employees for bad behavior that's a fantastic answer all right i lied i have two i have one more extra question are you gonna enter the elite uh, trades competition next year? Yes, I feel like I have to. <laughs> well, yeah, I was told to. that, um, they have like these forty foot banners down there, and I think they said I would be on one, so I have to go down and and yeah, have see to it. go on and see that. At least be like, hey, can I take that when you guys are done? Um, yes. My final question for you, Mac, and thank you so much for taking time. I know it's late where you are because we're on uh, different time zones, but if you had to choose a song to be the soundtrack of your life, what would it be? Well, before I won, it would be uh, Can't Cash My Checks from Jamie Johnson, but now I guess you can cash my checks. So if I had to pick a soundtrack of my life, uh, Simple Man, Leonard Skinner. Oh, good song, good song. I that would be it. Mac Schwartz, it was so great to talk to you for Toolbox for the Trades. I hope we get to meet in person, hopefully next year at the at the competition. Uh, but thank you so much, and keep doing great work. Yes, thank you for having me. Thank you for being a uh, let me be a guest with your. You have such like um, all the guests on your show have been amazing. So I can't believe I'm thank included you. with them. <laughs> you are included. You definitely are included in that. Thank you so much, Mac.